My name is Max Kobuck, and today I'm going to talk about how to get a job commercial fishing in Alaska. I'm a third generation commercial fisherman, and I started working as a deckhand the summer after I turned 16 when I sained for salmon in Chignik. The next three summers after that, I sained for squid out of California, and then I set netted for two summers back in Kodiak. After a two year break from fishing, I've been back at it for a few years doing herring, salmon, and tanner crab. When it comes to getting a job in this industry, I may not be the best person to ask since I was fortunate to grow up in a commercial fishing family. However, I've received quite a few messages with questions on this topic, so I will do my best to provide some useful insight. I won't be able to cover everything in this video, but my hope is that by the end of this, you have a pretty good idea of what you're getting yourself into. In order to understand this industry, let's take a step back and get a basic overview of the system we're working within. When boats go out and catch fish, they deliver it to one of the processing plants spread around Alaska, which are often referred to as cannery or simply the plant. The plant will process fish and send it off to its next destination around the world. Depending on the fishery, a boat called a tender will sometimes serve as a middleman taking fish from the boats out on the fishing grounds and delivering it back to the processing plant. There are several different types of fisheries in Alaska and each one requires different gear and methods. Purse seining, gill netting, long lining, pot fishing, and trawling are the five we will talk about today. A purse seine is used to target salmon and herring. Purse saners are typically 40 to 58 foot vessels with the cabin towards the bow and an open back deck. A small boat called a skiff is towed behind the saner and is attached to one end of the net. To make a set, the skiff is released and the net is pulled off the back deck as the main boat arcs in a circle. When the boat and skiff come back together, the skiff hands off its end of the net, connects to the tow line, and holds the boat in position while the net is hauled back onto the deck. Ideally, what you're left with is a big bag of fish, which can then be lifted or pumped into the fish hold. After all the fish is loaded, the end of your net is hauled on board, organized and reattached to the skiff for the next set. If you want to learn more details about how purse seining works, I have a few links to videos I can put in the description below. Gill netting is also common for salmon and sometimes herring, but rather than corral the fish like a seine, a gill net catches fish by locking onto their gills as they try and swim through the transparent mesh. Set gill netting and drift gill netting are the two main variations in this fishery. My family has a set net site on Kodiak where they spend their summers living in cabins and using open aluminum skiffs to get their gill nets in the water using a system of anchors to keep the net in position. The nets will get picked and cleaned a few times a day and the fish is held in totes on ice until it's delivered to a tender or the cannery. On the other hand, drift set netting is done from a small boat with a large wheel drum that keeps the gill net wrapped neatly. To make a set, a buoy connected to the end of the net is thrown off the stern and the net is pulled off the boat as the wheel unwinds. The net is then hauled back onto the drum as the crew picks out the fish by hand. The largest gill net fishery in Alaska is the legendary Bristol Bay Sockeye Run. Long liners pursue halibut, gray cod, and black cod using multiple sets of long line connected to multiple small anchors and a couple buoys. The length of the line that is close to the bottom has baited hooks evenly distributed along the way. After soaking for a few hours or so, depending on the situation, the line will be hauled back in and the fish will be put in the hold. Gray cod and black cod are also caught using pots set up with special tunnels that allow the fish to swim in. Crab pots are often repurposed for this, but black cod pots are sometimes much smaller and more specific to that fishery. Then of course, you have several different crabbing seasons, all fished with variations of crab pots. King crab, tanner crab, and dungeness crab are a few of the species, but there are many subspecies as well. Trawlers use a system of cable and steel doors to drag a funnel-shaped net through the water for pollock, gray cod, rockfish, Pacific Ocean perch, sole, and more. Boats doing pot cod, crabbing, or trawling are usually the largest boats you'll see in the harbor. 
Some boats are well over 100 feet, but there are also many boats that do these fisheries who also seine for salmon and herring in the spring and summer. Saners are limited to a maximum of 58 feet in length. You may have noticed I spent a lot more time covering seining and gill netting, and that's because generally speaking, these fisheries have more entry-level openings for beginners, which are referred to as greenhorns. Certain fisheries are very difficult, but not impossible to get into as a greenhorn, and that means you need to get some experience under your belt. I think most people would suggest that the salmon season is the best option for this. Now let's talk about tendering for a minute, which is a great option to get into commercial fishing. As I mentioned earlier, tenders take fish from fishing boats and deliver it to the processor. Tenders also transfer mail, groceries, fuel, and gear to and from the fishing grounds. This transaction allows fishing boats significantly more time with gear in the water, catching more fish. Tenders are usually much larger than the fishing vessels they take fish from, and therefore tenders are usually able to take fish from multiple boats in a single trip. Large boats that do pot fishing or trawling during the winter are often used for salmon tendering season in the summer. A salmon tendering contract usually lasts around 75 days, but it can be shorter or longer depending on the year and what area you're tendering in. This past summer, my wife Jade and I tendered out of Valdez on the Ocean Invictus. The salmon season here lasts from around June 1st through the first couple weeks of September. However, it's not open for fishing that entire time. Throughout a season, there are dozens of openings and closures, which are determined by how many salmon are making it upriver and several other factors. When it's not open for fishing, we either clean, work on projects, and once in a while, we get to hang out in town and explore the area. To get an idea of what tendering is really like, let's go out for a trip on the Ocean Invictus. Welcome to the sorting table. All the salmon we're pumping out of the Saner's fish hold comes out here and ends up in the weigh box at the end. A lot of times we sort the different species of salmon out here because different species are worth different amounts of money. But in this case, the boat was mostly catching pink salmon and didn't want us to waste time sorting. So I'm just shoveling fish down to help move things along. And most importantly, I'm making sure the gate is closed when we're taking weights so the weight is accurate.
3150. Another important part of this job is picking out the jellyfish, kelp, etc. that comes through. Now we're taking fish from a different boat and they decided to sort their fish. So one of their crew members is up on the table with me. to tender, it's essential that you know the difference between the five species of salmon. The names are dog salmon, red salmon, silver salmon, pink salmon, and king salmon. But they all have other names as well. Dogs are also chum, reds are also sockeye, silvers are also coho, pinks are also humpies, and kings are also chinook. There are many ways to tell the differences between these species but the easiest way to tell is by looking at the tail and the head. First, we'll look at the pink salmon. They are usually the smallest and most abundant salmon in Alaskan waters, especially in the Gulf. They have small scales, but the surest way to know a pink salmon is by the tail. There is little to no silver, and there are small black spots all over. Sockeye salmon are usually the most valuable of the five species, and they are distinguishable by their dark backs and having no markings on their tail. Coho salmon have black mouths, small eyes, and tails full of silver that give them their name. Dog salmon have very large eyes, torpedo-shaped bodies, and tails with variations of silver streaks. Last but not least is the king salmon, which has a black mouth and a silver tail with black dots. The two salmon that most people have a hard time discerning between are silvers and dogs. What usually confuses people is that both of their tails have silver with no spots. But if you look at their heads, you can see that the dog salmon pictured above here clearly has much larger eyes. The shape of the head is also different. In relation to their body, silvers have smaller, tapered heads compared to dogs. In addition, when comparing the tails, you can see here that the section just before the actual tail is much thicker on a silver than a dog. One of the last things to confuse you before we move on is that the appearance of all these salmon changes drastically when they get close to their freshwater breeding grounds. This transformation also intensifies the differences between males and females. Males get a hooked nose and a big hump on their backs, Females' bellies swell with all the roe they are holding. In this state, it is very easy to identify a chum salmon by the vertical lines along their bodies. Humpies and reds can somewhat look similar from afar, but a pink's tail spots are what gives it away. You may find this confusing at first, so don't be afraid to ask questions. I would also recommend setting aside one of each species so you can take the time to look them over carefully when you're not working. This is a hatchery, and as you can see, there's a lot going on. A hatchery basically hatches baby fish and then releases them into the wild to live their life before returning back to that same hatchery. There are 27 hatcheries in Alaska. When the fish return to the hatchery, some of the fish are kept to make a brood stock for the following season, but there's usually a huge excess of fish returning. That's where the saners come in to do cost recovery. Cost recovery is how the hatchery affords to keep its operation going. The hatchery allows processors to bid on quotas, and then the processors select fishing vessels to go catch the fish. The fish are worth a fraction of the normal price, but it's basically a guarantee that you're going to catch fish, and there's a lot of them. None of this really matters to a tender, though. We're just there to pick up the fish like normal. However, because a lot of these sets are so big, we usually just pump the fish directly out of the net. Because all of the salmon returning at this time are pinks, we don't have to sort at all, which is nice, but sometimes sorting fish helps the time pass more quickly.
thing to know before getting a job on a boat for any fishery is that you shouldn't necessarily take any job you can get. Just like any other industry, there are people operating at different levels in this game. You want to make sure you're getting on a boat that's safe, honest, and catches fish. If you ask around in any Alaskan fishing town, it shouldn't be hard to get a good idea of what a boat's operation is like. Getting hired on a boat usually happens through word of mouth or local bulletin boards. To be honest, to get a lot of these jobs, you really have to know someone. I'm not trying to discourage you, but I want you to know it can be tough. Nowadays, people have success reaching out through social media or looking through online listings. Some people also have luck buying a plane ticket and showing up a month or so before the season starts and just talking to people at the local coffee shops, walking the docks and asking around until they find a job. Sometimes people seem to think that any fishing job in Alaska is a guaranteed massive paycheck and this simply isn't the case. Several fisheries in Alaska have been struggling lately and the reasons for this would take an entire video series to cover. There is some uncertainty in regards to prices and run returns for this upcoming salmon season, so the industry is a bit unstable. That being said, I wish you the best of luck and be sure to say hi if you see me out there on the water.